All right, hello everybody and welcome back. This is going to be a, not a build video, but it's gonna be a tear down and a little bit of an explanation uh, of just some of the little nuances of building this printer, uh, some of the parts you're gonna need, and how to actually put some of those parts on the printer and you know just some of the things that I ran into, things like that. <clears throat> I just hope that it'll give a little bit of insight into what I did to build this printer and hopefully help someone else to build this printer as well. All right, so let's get started. Um, first, the first unique part that would be need to be noticed is this uh, x-axis assembly. Uh, quick dis disclaimer, I've already disassembled a lot of this printer just so that it'll make the video go a bit more smoothly. All right, the first thing that you will hopefully notice is this very long uh, x-axis rail. It, uh, it's, it's actually quite easy to implement this. You just take out the old rail, which is about 250 millimeters long, and then you put in a 500 millimeter, pe millimeter piece. It's a piece of 2020 V-slot from Open Builds, and all you have to do to uh, install it is drill a hole through here, where the old one used to be, and uh, then bolt it on there. You just have to put all, uh, keep all the remaining end stops and uh, things like that where they were, and uh, you use all the hardware that came with it. Um, I did modify this. I put a belt tensioner from Thingiverse on here, and I'll put that, the link in the description for that. And uh, I also put an E3D V6 on there, so I had to modify the, the hot end amount for that. But besides that, everything is stock or nearly stock. I have a few upgrades here, like some uh, a compression tensioner for, this, for the wheels here, for the Z-axis to stabilize that, and uh, a different extruder here. But that's not needed. You can actually keep all the stock except for that X-axis rail. I highly recommend the E3D hot end uh, so that you can later replace it with a volcano like I will do. Next up we'll be moving to the y-axis assembly. The first thing here to talk about is the glass build plate. This is held on with binder clips to the ledges of this aluminum profiling. As you can see this is an unheated build plate and um, although heated belt beds are nice, they're not really necessary. Uh, I actually use hairspray and blue tape, or a, a mix of the, not not a mix of the two, but I use them separately. Um, I use hairspray mainly, and then use isopropyl alcohol to help me release the part from the bed. I spray it around the part, and it seeps under it and uh, helps me release it. I recommend that method, and I'm also experimenting with other methods to make sure that you can not only have the part stick to the bed, but release it easily. If you have any uh, recommendations for that, definitely leave them in the comments below. But uh, that's what I use so far, and it seems to be working decently. I also have these spacers to keep the uh, bed from sagging in. This aluminum actually comes up about a millimeter from the acrylic base, and that leaves a millimeter for that uh, glass to sag over a one foot distance. So I would recommend printing these spacers, but if you don't, the mesh bed leveling that I have in, Mar in the Marlin firmware for this printer I actually would compensate for that. Uh, so while it's recommended, it's not necessary. Next, this is the base that the, the print bed actually sits on. As you can see, it's a piece of acrylic with aluminum profile on the edges right here. Uh, I got the aluminum from Home Depot and I actually super glued it to this base. Super glue works perfect as a binding agent, and I would highly recommend that over any other binding agent. The acrylic base is a little bit trickier to make because you have to have a laser cutter. Um, I would, and the reason I use the laser cutter is because I had access to one with my makerspace. But if you don't have one of these, um, try to get access because it, it makes the whole thing a lot smoother. I, I the first iteration of this printer, I actually used plywood and I drilled the holes with a hand drill. And while that works, it was not optimal. It was not ideal at all. It, uh, the, the whole spacing, uh, more crucially for this, was off and it made the bed wobbly. But if you can, laser cut this. The only part you need it for here is the four leveling holes for the screws to fit into. But if you can laser cut that, definitely do it. All right, next. This is actually probably the most crucial part of the entire build. It is the laser cut acrylic base that the wheels actually attach to. The reason this is so crucial is that, like I said, the wheels have to be perfectly aligned, or they have to be perfectly spaced to ride on this rail just right. It can't be too tight or it won't move very freely, and if it's too loose you'll have uh, wobbling issues, and a wobbly printer is not good ever. So, um, 
As you can see, the space actually has multiple hose, holes, so you can pick which uh, wheels you want to use. A minimum would be three, one here, one here, and one here. Um, a maximum would be 12, but that's not recommended. Eight works absolutely perfectly. You get very smooth motion, and uh, it's very stable. I can lift the whole thing by this, and there's no wobbling at all. And the prints uh, are a testament to that as well. I included pieces right here, uh, cut pieces for the belt to loop through and then you zip tie around and that works perfectly. Make sure that you have five, make you purchase five meters of GT2 belt for the total for the X axis or the X axis and the Y axis right here. Five meters will be just enough. It'll be perfect. Again, I have this Y-axis uh, belt tensioner. Both of these tensioners are highly recommended. They're easy to print and it uses all the standard hardware that came with the printer. I couldn't recommend that enough for getting the correct belt tension in your printer. Especially over such a long axis like this. It's very needed. Um, and this is the next uh, part of the, the build. This is, again, another pretty crucial part if you do it the way that I did it. The way that I did it is actually not the way that I would recommend it, but I'll explain how I did it regardless. It's what the files are made for, so if you choose to take this route, uh, you'll need to pay attention here. This is a, uh, these, okay, it's, it's uh, two one meter pieces of 2040 V-slot from Open Builds. I, and I, I bolted them together using T-slot rails, or T-slot uh, aluminum profiles from Mizumi. Uh, the spacing has to be absolutely perfect, which is why I wouldn't recommend doing it like this. Um, and yeah, I, I wouldn't recommend doing this. This took me multiple, I don't know how many hours, but it wasn't too many hours. It was like two hours maybe at most because I had to sit this uh, whole assembly on a granite table to make sure it was flat. And then I just bolt all this in and then I had to go and like individually measure with the calipers and things like that to make sure it was perfect and then fit on that. But um, overall it was worthwhile because now I have a, a like a 175 millimeters width, which makes this very stable, very rigid. But I think it's a bit overkill. I think one more thing about these rails right here in between in between the uh, V slot. These T slot uh, beams need to be exactly 155 millimeters. Uh, you can make it a little bit less. I actually compensate with the using the the brackets themselves. As you can see right here, there's actually a gap in between the rail and this, and that's mainly because. Um, the cuts that I used on my chop saw weren't perfect, so I cut them a little bit less than 50, 155 millimeters, and then I actually used the brackets to compensate for that, and that allows you to get a perfectly square fixture, as well as compensate for any lack of squareness in your cuts. The approach that I would recommend is actually using a, a piece of C-beam from OpenBuild's website. It's a, a piece of beam that uses the same V-slot grooves, but it's actually shaped like a C, and I believe it's 80 millimeters wide. And um, this, it, because it's all one piece, you can order a meter piece of this, and it's 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 wide enough, I believe, to support a one meter bed. I believe the CR10 uses um, actually at a 2040 on its on its end, laid on its end, so it only has 40 millimeters to stabilize it. This would have 80 millimeters um, on this new C-beam system, and that's what I would recommend. It's, it seems a lot simpler. And if you choose to do that, uh, the files would be easily, it would probably be easy to edit that just to bring these two holes closer together and fit up along that C-beam. So that's what I would recommend doing, and I may do that myself in the future. But again, this is an open source printer, so go ahead and do it yourself if you feel like you want to do that. Uh, I believe the next thing would be to talk about the electronics. Uh, these are actually just simple uh, ramps 1.4 board. This has always been my go-to board for a long time because it's cheap and it works, and it works well uh, most of the time. And uh, I, I probably wouldn't go with this in the future. I've been looking at the SKR boards uh, because they're 32-bit and seem to be more feature-packed. Um, but this is what I used, and you can if you want as well. It uses the standard RepRap LCD and uh, Marlin firmware. My Marlin configuration file is going to be in the links below on my GitHub page. 
but um, everything's all pretty standard here. That, I, that's an upgrade from what the Tronxy came with. If you're familiar, the Tronxy actually comes with a Melzi board, and Melzi boards are pretty much the worst board you can get. Upgrades in the future for this are going to be to add a BL Touch. Currently, I'm using manual mesh bed leveling, and that works uh, actually quite well, but a BL Touch would help to automate that process, and I'm looking forward to that. And uh, a more crucial upgrade would be the Volcano Heat Block. Uh, an E3D Volcano. Like I said earlier, this uses a, an E3D V6, and I'm, I, I've been running into some flow rate issues with that. Uh, over such long distances and higher speeds, you, you, the hot end can't melt the plastic as quickly enough, so I'll be moving to a 0.8 millimeter Volcano nozzle quite soon. Uh, I want to put a Capricorn tubing, um, like I said, a C-beam rail for this Y-axis, and um, I'll be experimenting with some different print bed options because I still don't want to go with a heat bed, but I would like to go with uh, maybe a, an easy peelsy or something along, along those lines. But uh, there's definitely room for improvement on this printer. And, uh, and oh, another upgrade I want to do is uh, a Z-axis upgrade. As you've seen earlier, this actually is a cantilever Z-axis, uh, ZX, XZ system. And um, I, I wouldn't recommend that. It's, it's simple and it makes the build easy. But for higher speeds or any heavier, if, if I want to put a direct drive extruder on that, it would not support it. And I would, I, in the future, I would like to experiment with, with a better Z-axis, one that's more stable and one that's taller. I'll keep you guys updated on that, but that's what, this is what I have in the moment. Referring back to the electronics, uh, this actually uses a standard 12-volt laptop power supply right here. It plugs directly into the terminals here, and it does a perfect job of powering all that I need to power here. So you don't really need a big power supply uh, since you're not using a heat bed. So this printer is actually really power efficient as well. But um, again, that's all you need. So thanks. Alrighty, guys, thanks for watching, and uh, I hope that I did a good enough job of explaining all the little specifics of this printer. Um, Again, it's not hard to build, I just want to make sure that I explain everything correctly and make sure that there's no hidden hurdles that you have to jump when you actually build this yourself. Uh, I would highly recommend doing this build or a similar build uh, just to, to extend uh, one axis of the printer because like I've said before in a previous video, I actually prefer a long bed to a, a large square bed because I find when you run out of your, when you go beyond your bounds in terms of build area, it's always only in one axis, like a long sword or a, a boat or an RC plane or something like that. They're always long, they're not just big. So at least that's what I find with my files that I print. Uh, a lot of what I do is actually functional, and, but again, you can do things like cosplay with swords or something if you're into that. And I think there's a great need for something like this in the community, so go ahead, download the files for this, uh, build your own, or at least just use it as inspiration. I enjoy the build a lot and I enjoy this printer quite a bit. Uh, I enjoy the prints that I get off of it and it, it, it does a good job, so. Thanks, uh, check out my other videos, leave a comment, give me some constructive criticism, and uh, I'll see you guys in the next video, which should be coming quite, quite soon, actually. So thanks for watching. Bye.